coalition of uh, Croatian civil society uh, organizations. Uh, these are Center for Peace Studies, GONG, uh, Human Rights House uh, Zagreb, Institute for Political Ecology, Zelena Akcija, Friends of the Earth Croatia, Roda Parents in uh, Action, Croatian Union of Associations for Autism, uh, Cluster Network, and Croatian uh, Youth uh, Network. We are uh, a group of uh, organizations uh, that have been dealing with issues of shrinking civic space in various uh, ways during the, uh, the past several uh, years. With this conference, uh, we want to get the representatives of uh, civil society, uh, but also institutions, uh, academia, and other actors uh, working on combating uh, uh, shrinking civic space, uh, and to discuss recent uh, developments, uh, recent policy developments, uh, but also other uh, developments, of course. Uh, we will, in these two days, uh, discuss the trends and perspe uh, perspectives on uh, creating an uh, enabling environment uh, for civil society. Uh, also, uh, with this conference, we wanted to raise awareness and uh, inform uh, primarily Croatian civil society organizations and institutions on the recent discussions on these topics at the EU uh, level. Uh, but also talk a bit uh, more about development in uh, other EU member uh, states and uh, beyond. Uh, th therefore, we will uh, in do these uh, two mornings, uh, today and tomorrow, uh, have uh, four panels uh, that will uh, deal with these uh, issues. Uh, today, we will start with the panel on uh, shrinking civic space uh, in several uh, EU uh, countries, and we will try to see what are the processes, the trends and perspectives in these countries. The second panel today uh, will deal with SLAPS as a tool against uh, uh, civil society organizations and uh, activists, but also, of course, uh, journalists. Uh, uh, tomorrow, in the first uh, panel, we will talk about uh, EU responses uh, or possible EU responses to shrinking civic space. And in the second panel tomorrow, we will deal more with what uh, civil society uh, has done and what civil society responses and initiatives are in uh, this uh, field. Um, uh, also, uh, so other than um, recording uh, this conference, we will also make a report of uh, the conference that we will send to relevant institutional and civil society actors. After uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, conference, um, and uh, I hope uh, some of our conclusions uh, will um, at least make an inspiration for um, some new actions uh, and uh, initiatives. Um, at the end of this very short uh, conference uh, opening, uh, I would like to thank Civitates for giving us uh, financial and other support uh, for organization of this uh, conference. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, all my colleagues and partner organizations uh, that gave their time uh, and uh, helped organize uh, the conference. And of course, uh, I would uh, very much like to thank the speakers and uh, moderators uh, in these uh, uh, two days. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us and sharing your uh, insights and uh, experiences uh, with us. Um, Without, without much ado, I would uh, like to start uh, the first panel of this uh, conference that we named uh, Shrinking Civic Space in the EU, Processes, Trends and uh, uh, Perspectives. Uh, we could see uh, several initiatives uh, at the EU level in uh, the past uh, uh, couple, couple of uh, years. Maybe for us, it was the, the thing that was very important was the European Parliament uh, resolution in March uh, this year uh, that uh, uh, recognized that there are trends uh, and uh, uh, processes of degradation of 
uh, civic space throughout uh, the uh, EU and that there are uh, policies hampering uh, CSO's operations, their access to sustainable funding and their ability to uh, participate in decision uh, making. Um, uh, however, these uh, practices uh, of Schengen civic space have different uh, intensities and forms in uh, different uh, countries. And in this panel, we will discuss the state of uh, civil society in several uh, EU member states. Uh, namely, uh, today we will talk about uh, Poland, Slovenia, Croatia and Romania. Uh, especially in relation to access to funding, uh, participation in decision making and institutional, but also social uh, conditions and framework uh, for uh, civil uh, society. So some of the questions that we will raise uh, are, uh, what is the present state or position uh, of civil society in these countries? What are the different uh, forms of shrinking civic space uh, in these countries? What political, social and economic uh, context or, uh, or conditions led to degradation of civic space in these countries? What are the similarities, but also what are the, the differences uh, in these uh, trends? And how did the civil society respond and also what European Union uh, actions were uh, in this uh, field. Uh, as you could see from uh, the agenda, uh, we will uh, speak uh, about uh, uh, this uh, uh, with with uh, our speakers. Uh, they are uh, Malgorzata Szuleka uh, from uh, Polish Helsinki Foundation for uh, Human Rights. Thank you for coming. Uh, then uh, Barbara Reigel uh, from uh, Faculty of Social uh, Sciences, University of Ljubljana, and uh, the Legal Network for uh, the Protection of Democracy uh, uh, from Slovenia. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for coming as well. Uh, then Ivan Novosel from Human Rights uh, House uh, Zagreb. Uh, thank you, Ivan, and um, uh, Jonas Sibian from uh, Romanian Civil Society Development Foundation should join us at uh, 10.30 uh, as he had a prior uh, event uh, that is, uh, uh, oh, uh, I think that Jonas just um, uh, joined us. Hi. Uh, hello, Jonut. I was just introducing uh, our speakers today and said that you will join us in uh, 15 minutes. Uh, but thank you for being here um, uh, before. Um, OK, uh, so uh, maybe uh, let's start with uh, the Polish uh, uh, example. Uh, Malgorzata Szuleka, Gosha uh, will uh, uh, speak about this uh, today. Just a, a brief uh, introduction. Uh, Gosha is the head of advocacy at the Polish uh, Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights. Uh, since 2009, uh, she has been one of uh, the uh, foundation's leading lawyers and researchers often uh, partnering with, uh, among others, the European Agency for uh, Fundamental Rights on major research projects uh, concerning topics including children's rights, rights of victims of crimes and access to justice. And uh, she has also been uh, document documenting uh, the rule of uh, law crisis in Poland by publishing numerous briefs and reports uh, concerning changes to the judicial system uh, and uh, attacks on judges and uh, prosecutors. Uh, her research and advocacy focus on issues concerning uh, the independence of judiciary, uh, threats to the rule of law and democratic back backsliding, as well as shrinking uh, civic uh, uh, civil society uh, space. Uh, Gosha, thank you for coming once again, and the floor is yours for the first uh, introductory intervention. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to virtually join this meeting, and thank you to, to the organizers for 
uh, providing to us with the opportunity to look into the specific situations of uh, civic uh, spaces across the EU. As you said, I'm going to focus on the situation in Poland. So maybe I will just start with a brief uh, contextual information. So the, in general, the Polish civil society remains very relatively large and very vibrant. We have over 150,000 different civil society organizations registered, plus numerous informal groups and then local communities that also perform some activities as the as the civil society which was particularly visible during um the response to the war in ukraine how many individuals just step in um as as a part of the civil society uh but with that being said uh i observed that over the last seven years with the progression of the rule of law crisis in poland we also see how the framework and the both legal and policy framework for the civil society is getting narrower and narrower so maybe i would just start with a couple of examples of the attacks on the civil society so you have uh so you will have a bit of a gist on um, how the situation looks like. So out of this 150,000 uh, civil society organizations in Poland, uh, majority of them are the charity organizations or education or sports um, edu um, sport related um, institutions, organizations. Uh, but two per it is estimated that like 2% of uh, of those organizations are related to work of uh, human rights democracy and, and democracy and these are those organizations who have been particularly targeted by um those changes in the legal framework and um and those legal frameworks and uh policy changes so um what we've been observing and it's actually kind of a link to your second panel is that in the last seven years there is a huge number raising number of different legal proceedings against organizations and civil society activists we call them slabs uh, we call them slabs even before it became the buzzword um but um what we particularly seen um, are the couple categories of those uh, of those cases. So the first large chunk of those proceedings uh, proceedings concerns everyone who tries to uh, exercise the right to uh, the freedom of assemblies. So um, it is estimated by one of the organizations of RP who organize a lot of street protests and civic disobedience against. Um, and the restrictions in the freedom of assemblies, they estimate that for over the last four years, there was almost 1,000 different kinds of proceedings concerning different activists in relation to the freedom of um, of assemblies. Many of those proceedings were discontinued, uh, but there were some that ended with the conviction of the activists. Some of them were um, acquitted of the charges. Still, uh, we can see that this is like a very well organized practice from both police and police and public prosecutors to prosecute those who are taking the protest to the streets. Secondly, we also see criminal charges against certain uh, civil society activists. So, for example, in the peak of the anti-abortion protests, uh, anti <laughs> in the peak of the uh, abortion-related protests in 2020 during the lockdowns and the pandemic, um, the Constitutional Tribunal in Poland issued a judgment that absolutely restricted in practice access to abortion. And the protests in relation to that decision were the biggest protests in Poland since 1999, since the fall of the communism. And three of the organizers, I mean, many of those protests were just um, grassroots initiatives, but the te prosvjede su bile organizacije i koje funkcioniraju na razini zajednica. Međutim, tri organizacije iz Varšave se soočavaju sa kaznenim prijavama za ugrožavanje javnog reda i mira i opće sigurnosti zbog organiziranja tih prosvjeda. To zvuči jako smiješno, međutim, to zapravo najbolje oslikava opću atmosferu i to je nešto što je jako zabrinjavajuće. Jako bitni su i koreci nekakvih građanskih parnica. Dakle, imamo prostor koji se zove prostor bez LGBT IQ-a i 
the names of the uh, what local, um, government um, regions Postavili su zapravo i e, imena tih regija koje su osvojili takve rezolucije. Od... Uh, homophobic attitudes and actions. Another element is the prosecution of civil uh, society activists who are operating on the Polish-Belarusian border. As you may know, there is the humanitarian crisis going on there since uh, last year uh, when uh, numerous people try to cross the border irregularly. Um, and uh, there is no humanitarian response coming from the state authorities. So uh, the only humanitarian and medical aid is provided by the activists and some of them are also prosecuted for the work they are doing there. So this is on one side, but the another thing is that If we say that this uh, that the space for the closing and for the civil society in Poland is closing, I have to add to that that it's not for everyone. Because indeed, some of those organizations critical to the government, that they see more and more challenges, be it, um, as I said, the legal procedures or restrictions in access to funding. But on the other hand, those organizations loyal to the government, they are lavishly supported by different states institutions. And we see uh, the amount of ma money actually being pumped into those organizations. Just one of the most stellar examples is the far-right organization that organized the Independence March for many years in Warsaw. Uh, they are known for the um, racist and xenophobic attitudes, and they received over half million slotes uh, for support for Ukrainian refugees after the outbreak of war. And this money came from the public um, ad hoc uh, scheme, fun funding scheme. Why it wasn't distributed to the organizations that do have experience in helping migrants and refugees, and there are many of them in Poland, it's still beyond me, but it actually shows, uh, I think this, uh, this example is very telling um, and indicative to show how the government is actually uh, choosing only the organizations that are not critical towards it and um, remain loyal, but also they are building the parallel civil society um, in, in the sector. And another element of those um, legal and policy changes that we are seeing in, in Poland is also, as you mentioned, Sarah, and uh, as it was also rightly picked by the European Parliament resolution, is the um, restrictions in the access to uh, decision-making process. So, for example, For my organization, for over 30 years, we work very closely with the parliament in providing our expert opinions on the legal changes concerning human rights. And uh, I, I wouldn't say that it was always perfect, but at least there was some space for the discussion. Uh, but we see how the space is getting narrower and narrower, and it's getting much more difficult to actually present our expert opinions during the parliamentary committees, for example. So one of the examples is from seven years ago, when the government decided to push uh, the biggest changes to the constitutional tribunal. And my colleagues spent uh, 11 hours at the session of the parliamentary committee. And the chairman of the committee said that uh, he, my colleague will be given the floor after the uh, voting is closed and the entire discussion is closed. So uh, it happened. Uh, it's. The process started like that, and for the last seven years, it hasn't improved at all in, in this regard. And on the top of that, of course, we see uh, that the like the reverse and the, or something that the process that underpins the entire process of closing civic space is the polarization of the discussion. So uh, organizations are um, attacked by public media. We also saw examples of smear campaigns. But the worst part is that uh, is that deepening polarization within the civil society. So there is, there are us and others, and it can translate to so many um, uh, different, I would say. Um, themes that the government uses in the political narration. But I don't want to end on that. So just my 
final uh, thought in that round would be that there is still hope in the Polish civil society. And um, one of those uh, examples, um, this huge mobilization after the outbreak of war. And the latest data show that uh, 70% of the Polish society in general was somewhat engaged in helping Ukrainian refugees. This is actually very promising and um, and uh, I would say a remarkable example of um, how vibrant and compassionate uh, still uh, the Polish civil society can be after those huge changes. So I'll just end on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gosha. I think we will uh, we will have uh, uh, some of the issues that you raised will be very important uh, and uh, interesting for later discussion. Uh, before uh, we move uh, on, I just realized and I was reminded that I forgot uh, to tell you that uh, we will first uh, have a couple of rounds uh with our uh panelists uh and after uh and during uh this uh i invite at attendees uh to uh give comments or ask questions uh through the qa uh section uh, on the toolbar uh and uh we will use uh, the uh, last part of uh, this panel uh, to I will read those questions and uh, you will get uh, the answers uh, to them. Uh, okay, uh, now we we can move on to Slovenian uh, examples uh, uh, example. Uh, and uh, first I will introduce um, our speaker from Slovenia today. Uh, Barbara Reigel is an uh, assistant professor of legal studies at the Fac Faculty of Social Sciences, University of uh, Ljubljana, where she teaches uh, labor and social security uh, law, uh, basics of law and business uh, law. Her main uh, research interests are anti-discrimination law, human uh, rights, uh, industrial relations, employment relations, social security law, and uh, family uh, law. She is the co-founder uh, of Bar and Cultural uh, Center in uh, Pritlicie, uh, the Institute for uh, Culture of uh, Diversity Open, uh, and the legal network uh, for the protection uh, of uh, democracy. Uh, Barbara, thank you for coming once again, and um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, maybe for the introduction, a few more words about uh, legal network uh, for protection of democracy. Uh, it's a Slovenian network of four uh, non-NGOs collaborating together uh, with legal experts and lawyers. Uh, the network was founded in January uh, uh, 21, in response to the illegal and uh, unconstitutional management of the COVID crisis, and in particular in response to the complete ban on protests, uh, which was decreed by uh, then right-wing government of Janis Janša. After the change of government this summer, uh, the legal network continues to deal uh, with the protection of the right to protests, freedom of speech, and right to information. More and more people are turning to us also because of the violation of the right to a healthy uh, living environment and because of a violation of social rights. So on Sunday, we have three referendums. Uh, one of them is a referendum on the amendment of the law on radio television of Slovenia. Uh, the legal network prepared the basic principles and starting points uh, for this new law, which wants to change the administration of the Slovenian public broadcaster in such a way that there would be no representatives of political parties in the management bodies of the public broadcaster, um, because these uh, management bodies and uh, especially um, information program of, of the TV was uh, actually completely subordinated by the Janša's rule. Uh, so uh, we would like to somehow depolit 
is a uh, size the the uh, public broadcaster in other areas as well we want to work to uh, towards greater democratization uh, also in the field of uh, management of common affairs so our actions at the beginning were aimed uh, at helping individuals who were either in criminal uh, or misdemeanor proceedings due to freedom of expression or prohibition of protests after only a few weeks, we realized that the violations were systemic. So we started few strategic litigation proceedings. The most successful was the ruling by the Constitutional Court that a complete ban of protest, on protests is unconstitutional. Later on, we also started preparing the amendments to act on infectious diseases as the part of the old law was annulled by the Constitutional Court, as it, uh, it didn't uh, sufficiently guarantee the protection of human rights. Politicians didn't want to deal with this topic due to the fear of the opponents of the measures, so we took the burden of drafting the law, as well as the dialogue with the opponents. So I consider the legal network to be a good practice in opposing emerging authoritarian rule. Its greatest advantage is in connecting different organizations with different competencies. Uh, second, the connection of superior, that's uh, really top theoretical and practical legal knowledge. And I would say the most important, the network entered the public space on time. Uh, legal means can no longer be effectively used when the government subord subordinates also the judiciary. In two years, the previous Janša's government managed to subordinate the police, partly the state attorney's office, tried to influence the state prosecutor's office, but has not yet broken down the last dam of the rule of law, that is judiciary. And uh, for, uh, for the last, uh, uh, the biggest threats to independent uh, civil society and democracy, at, at least in uh, Slovenia, are first burnout. Only one person in regular, for example, in uh, at the legal network is regularly employed. Most of the other uh, work uh, alongside their other obligations, uh, which is really not sustainable in the long term. And then financial uh, financing issues. The legal network operated exclusively with donations from people who were harassed by the previous government. In the future, we need an independent systemic source of funding, perhaps or also a strengthened donation system, as well, of course, uh, as European and national funds to support our basic operation. Uh, because we don't want to invent imaginary projects for imaginary problems, but we want to do what we estimate as the most necessary in the society. And um, also, um, the last thing I would uh, like to, to um, uh, comment is the problem of academy. If, he, uh, if we, in the last two years, uh, had waited for the support from the academy or their action, uh, today we would have a new uh, four years uh, term of Janis Jan Jansha and a uh, new social si subsystem would be under attack. Not only that the academy is passive, it is harmful because it is not sensitive to trends, but it's only able to analyze uh, the past and at best they are able to analyze the current situation. At the beginning of our activity, we received, for example, a very patronizing message from really uh, important uh, professor um, and researcher who lives in UK and he deals with the erosion of democracy in Europe and in the world. And uh, this message was that our situation is not comparable to Poland and Hungary. Also because we did not take his opinion into account, today he can say that he was right. Uh, so a big problem in Slovenia, um, um, besides all those that were uh, told already in, uh, in Poland, 
are financial issues and uh, not a lot of activities from those uh, that really are um, in in fact uh, the only one that are really independent is the academy in financial sense and also in all other senses so uh, maybe one more thing about uh, slabs uh, i would just like to say that uh, um, I'm quite, I fear that uh, a slap um, uh, issue will become a buzzword, that uh, all these um, supporting mechanisms uh, from the European Union will start and end at the new directive that is not covering all the, the, most, uh, the most important issues. And one of them is uh, that was already explained, the criminal proceedings. The new slab directive only covers the civil proceedings, but in uh, this is maybe um, okay for the West, uh, Western uh, uh, democratic countries where you have slabs from corporations, mostly uh, uh, tort or, um, or civil, civil proceedings. But in, in uh, our countries, uh, the most active uh, slapper is uh, the government. And government does it not through the civil proceedings, but through misdemeanor and uh, through criminal proceedings. And this is uh, these are things that I think we need to be very, um, very attentive at. So, um, for the start, thank you. Um. Thank you, uh, Barbara, for explaining uh, the, the the Slovenian context and how uh, your legal network uh, worked. Uh, and I think that uh, this last input that uh, you gave on slabs uh, will be a really good introduction for uh, the next panel. Uh, now, I think we can move to Romanian uh, example. Uh, today with us, we have Ionut Sibian, who is the executive director of the Civil Society Development uh, Foundation from uh, Romania, uh, which is an organization uh, whose mission is to develop the capacity of uh, civil society organizations and communities and to improve uh, people's lives through information, funding, training uh, and um, advocacy. Uh, and uh, he has been very active uh, in, in the fields of enabling environment for um, civil society development. And maybe other thing that is very relevant to say about uh, Jonut, that he has been the member of uh, the Group 3 uh, Civil Society Organizations Group of the uh, European Economic and uh, Social Committee for the fourth term uh, now, so since uh, 2007. So I think that Jonas could share a lot uh, also about uh, the developments at the EU, EU uh, level. Uh, Jonut, you can start. Hi, <clears throat> it's great to be with uh, you today. I'll start, uh, I'll try to, to uh, copy a bit Margot Zata to give you some <coughs> um, details about uh, uh, the size of Romanian NGO sector. So according to the data uh, we used last year for our research, there are about 121,000 uh, NGOs registered in Romania. Out of those, 100,000 are associations and about 20,000 are foundations. Of course, not all of them are active. We estimate that uh, less than half are active and how we define if they're active or not. It's uh, if they um, uh, submit the balance sheet uh, in uh, um, May when we are obliged by the law to do so. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, there is no room for organizations that they don't have a, a financial activity. They are based on volunteering, but this we cannot uh, estimate. Anyway, uh, this is the, the sector. And I think uh, looking on in the region, I think we... we uh, done quite a good job uh, surviving uh, uh, in all the, uh, um, let's say, the recipes that they try to copy from, from Hungary, uh, Slovenia, and Poland between 2017 and, and, and 2019 before the uh, EU elections. Uh, and there, there were attempts to uh, change the law on association and foundation based on the um, Hungarian uh, model. 
and uh, the peak of uh, all these campaigns and uh, uh, fight the politicians at that time was the referendum in 2018 October for redefinition of the family. So basically, it was a clear attack on uh, sexual minorities and the rights of single parenting uh, uh, family and so on. And at that time, we invited uh, our uh, uh, colleagues from uh, from Croatia to teach us how they've done it <laughs> and not to repeat the same mistakes. And luckily, the, the uh, referendum didn't pass. That was a huge uh, uh, success for, for, for us. Uh, against the politicians, but also against the church, because always uh, the politician took into consideration the church and they overestimated their power. So it was not just the Orthodox Church, it was all the churches. For the first time, they were hating each other in Romania, but for the first time, they were united. So also with the third sector, we've been united. And I think uh, uh, that was a great achievement uh, uh, for for uh, our countries. The people didn't go to vote, basically. It was out of 41 counties that Romania has, just on one county that uh, uh, the referendum passed, that it's it was over everyone uh, uh, expectation and it kept for two days they they organized it for two days in order to be sure that they will be able together with the church to mobilize the people to 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 vote um so this was the moment that we start to to regain ground and i will uh, um, describe the situation in romania between uh, 2019 and today as uh, you know put on hold things i mean there are not bad things happening not uh, many good things happening at the legal framework level and the relation with uh, with the authorities but we 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 freeze the 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 processes till this week when uh, the liberal party uh, member uh, put some changes in the senate that is the upper chamber of the romanian parliament uh some amendments to the law and association and foundations basically what they uh, would like to do is to um uh, diminish the the rights of civic uh, uh, ngos to put forward legal actions against local authorities so basically uh and not just local authorities but also developers the sharks in in constructions and uh, uh yeah these areas uh uh, they were saying in the explanatory note that uh, this is needed because we don't have highways in Romanian investors because uh, uh, these NGOs are uh, stopping it in the in the uh, in the court. So just to give you a glimpse of what they what are the the issues they are asking, an NGO to be able to to sue an authority or a, a, a developer it needs to have two years of uh, since they were been established. They, the the uh, um, uh, complaint should be uh, um, linked with the scope of the organization. So if you don't have in the statutes, I don't know, protection of uh, um, national parks, and there it's a developed doing works uh, illegally, you cannot do uh, anything. If you're a community-based organization, I say, and don't put everything in the statutes, then you should attach when you go to the court, the decision of the board with the votes, nominal votes, who and how voted in the, in the, in the board. And you should meet, submit a guarantee of 1% of the, of the, um, um, amount that you contested, uh, but not more than uh, 10,000 euros. So how many of us would be able to, to submit this warranty uh, uh, before launching a, a proceeding? So we were stuck when we, we've seen this. Uh, it's a wake up call when we seen it this week in, in the, in the parliament. And this, uh, we discovered that the Senate passed another law, uh, uh on, uh, um, Another area, you know, that is linked with this one is already passed with hope the, the parliament will, will, uh, the, the, the president will send it back in the parliament. And in this one that is linked with constructions and developers and so on, they are calling us ma ma malicious interested social bodies. 
on this idea that we are against the progress, economic progress, and uh, you know that's why we don't have highways in Romania. So this is uh, this is uh, now uh, uh, a trend, and we are trying to coalize and uh, to properly respond to, to this. Um, otherwise, we just launched FEDSC, We launched uh, the USAID index uh, on uh, uh, um, sustainability of CSOs, and we've been uh, till the end of last year on a positive trend. So we are against the trend in the region. We've been against the trend in the region, raising our uh, um, standard with one point that it's, it was quite good. And you see it at the infrastructure level, you see it at the public image level. I mean, NGOs in Romania, like in Poland, was the first uh, uh, um, uh, uh, line of uh, helping the refugees this uh, uh, effort was greatly appreciated even by the polit politician the like mining politician by uh, business sector and by population it's obvious that the money from the so called norwegian fund active citizens fund that we are managing and in romania is quite large we have 50 million euros at the moment we are supporting directly over 400 projects and indirectly with partnership thousands of NGOs uh, uh, it starts to pay the results. You you see the, the, the capacity increasing. You see a lot of things going on around the country. And in area where we didn't have civil society, geographical areas in Romania, that is the south and southeast that are our poorest regions in the EU. So even there, the the the, the program and the efforts are, are visible. Um, now going a bit very short to the European context together with with our colleagues from Stefan Battery, but Okotars from Hungary, they were the initiator. Two years ago, we started this idea to put on the table of, of the European Commission uh, a proposed uh, strategy for civil society. We wanted that to have minimum standards at the European level for civil society, because always it's it's this discussion with, with the politicians when they put on the table such damaging uh, legal acts, you know, what is the standard? So uh, it was difficult in the beginning, but now it seems that we are on on a good track. On 10th of December, the European Commission will launch this report on civic space. There will be some conclusions and recommendations, and we have this, uh, you know, unofficial news that the Swedish presidency will have uh, at the Council in March uh, conclusions on the civic space. And this will be, you know, uh, we hope that what will we, we could achieve, it's a, a action plan at the EU level, coping the uh, democracy part or uh, the, the the one for media and journalists to defend the sector, to, to set up a, a minimum standards and to defend civic activists. Uh, and this then I think could be part of the rule of law monitoring mechanism that will have every year in December this uh, questionnaire that all of us should go and uh, and uh, fill uh, fill it in where we have the expertise we shouldn't if we don't have the expertise for all the areas uh, that's it but we should be as many as possible and to try to uh, uh, talk among us at the uh, European level in order to put pressure on the European Commission uh, to be not just an exercise to take the consultation, but things to to be happening, and uh, you know where you have these uh, uh, damaging legal actions against uh, civil society, uh, uh, the the commission and we all to to act and to be solid with our colleagues. And one more thing that I would like to add is the media independence uh, in the region. In Romania, we see even there is no uh, a political uh, a change in the legislation. This is happening because there is no funding for independent media. You know, the only funding that you have now in our region is the state publicity. I'll give you an example. If the prime minister is going to uh, um, uh, a region, the regional authority is buying to the newspaper up to thirty thousand euros publicity. You know. This is huge amount of money for the, for a coverage of a visit, you know. So how this newspaper local outlet will dare to criticize the social authorities or to 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 have the watchdog function if they are totally relying in this fund? So they are buying everything, you know. The the the, the independent media will disappear, and this is another area that we should act together to find ways to fund. Uh, uh, independent media and to put pressure on donors, you know, to, to get it 
inside the package for 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 civil society to help uh, journalists to set up associations to be able to apply to to funds and so on and one last thing it's the uh, the instruments of of uh, serve citizen equality rights and value instrument we've been very active with some of you you know uh, uh, criticizing the european commission for for co-funding rule that are unacceptable who has after covid uh, uh, we spend a lot of money during the covid to help the communities now in in our country we put all our reserve on the and in poland in other countries on the refugee crisis where to get the 20 percent to to co-fund so another issue is how to convince the european commission to take out co-funding for instance in romania for active citizens fund for norwegian fund we took out the co-funding so if they don't want to have co-funding ngos they could re uh, 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 structure the budget and take it out and it's working you know so yeah, I will stop here for the moment. Uh, thank you, uh, Jonut. We will also in this uh, second round of uh, interventions uh, talk about uh, some of the EU mechanisms and see how rule of law reporting uh, worked for us. Uh, what what can we expect from uh, the EU civil society strategy, etc.? Uh, so thank you for uh, starting this uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, now I would like to move uh, to Ivan Novosel, who I also think uh, got a great introduction from you because I, I could really recognize uh, some of the issues that you um, talked about uh, seemed really familiar for us uh, in Croatia. And I'm uh, sure Ivan will uh, talk more about them. Uh, so Ivan uh, Novosel is uh, the director of programs at Human Rights House Zagreb, uh, where he uh, coordinates uh, human rights watchdog research, monitoring advocacy and uh, educational activities uh, to uphold and promote human rights. Uh, he's the author um, or co-author uh, of uh, research reports on human rights and the rule of law and shadow reports on uh, international human rights uh, mechanisms. Uh, Ivan is uh, also a member of several um, uh, bodies. Uh, one is Ombudsperson's uh, Human Rights uh, Council, the Croatian government's Advisory Council on Civil Society Development, and the Croatian Government Council on uh, Human uh, Rights. Uh, Ivan, uh, please turn on your mic and talk to us. <laughs> the mic is on. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Good to see all of you. Um, with some of you, I'll, I'll be uh, some of you I'll see soon in 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 person. But it's good to see uh, you on a particular that I haven't seen for a number of years now, pre-COVID uh, um, um, time. Hope that will change uh, soon. I'm in a little bit different uh, uh, position that you were because I'm speaking to uh, mostly Croatian uh, civil society uh, representatives and, and human rights defenders. So I'm sure uh, whatever I say today will uh, be quite familiar to them and every and each uh, them uh, of them uh, could add uh, uh, multiple layers um, uh, on it. And I'm sure I won't mention all of the all of the problems. But anyways, this is not the point of this um, of this discussion um, uh, today. But um, uh, to uh, to provide um, um, a perspective on on on, on tendencies there and where we are um, uh, right now. Um, well, first of all, let me start with saying that next year uh, Croatia will mark the 10th anniversary since we joined the um, the uh, the European uh, Union, and we, as a country, proved the uh, the uh, the rule that what you uh, do in terms of social change before you become an EU member states, um, uh, you've done it for uh, next uh, couple of years or maybe. Um, uh, decades, and we proved that um, uh, the, 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 that, ans that 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 policy rule basically on the um, on the EU level. Um, although we had the brief uh, illiberal rule, um, similar to what we were seeing and what we are seeing in Poland and in Hungary. I would say that we were lucky enough for that rule not too long, not to last for uh, for too long. But in this brief six months back in 2016, 
um they've done a tremendous damage that uh, uh still haven't been uh, uh, uh mitigated or recovered um uh, completely um but um we are not only dealing with consequences of that uh, uh, um, explosion or, or, or damage that was done in 2016, I would say and argue that we are dealing with a much bigger problem, and that is uh, the current government of continuity of, of uh, HZ that is in power ever since uh, um, um, uh, then. It's um, uh, keeping us like frogs in, uh, in, 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 in a pot of water, that uh, is on the stove uh that was uh that water was cold but now it's slowly heating and we are not being able to get out of it in and then make some um, uh, good for us and then and change uh for um uh, for the society and uh this uh how to say flat uh, um, uh status of, of croatia where there is no progress but it's not regression is um is proving to be extremely hard position for human rights organizations and advocates to explain to the um, uh, decision makers on the eu um level why partly because of what yonut was saying before the eu is growing its understanding and mechanisms to grasp the the issues around the um, uh, civic um, uh, around the civic um, uh, space, but uh, on, on on the level of political pragmatism, when you have cases like Poland and and, and Hungary with a clear cut rule of law, uh, breaches of that magnitude, no one is paying uh, from Brussels attention to a small and um, uh, unfortunately relatively insignificant country on the European um, uh, periphery, um, which is um, uh, which is a both uh, a shame for our politicians, but also a shame for the uh, for the European. Um, institution. So that is where we are in the in the contextual um, 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 uh, terms. Now, um, rather than than enumerating um, all the problems that we have in Croatia when it comes to civil society, or you will you will hear me speaking more about human rights defenders. I'm coming from that field, and we are just right now. We, we are just writing now our thematic report on situation of human rights defenders. So I'm, I'm, I'm in in that topic. I will uh, rather present three uh, claims, three statements about where we are when it comes to civil society right now. And the first statement is that Croatian government has a contempt for uh, genuine dialogue and civic participation of Croatian citizens and is uh, afraid of criticism. Uh, and is running away from any criticism and labeling any criticism as um, um, an attack to whatever they are um, doing. Uh, that's the first claim. Now the evidence. Um, we see that um, multi-stakeholder dialogue system that was built up during the accession period to the uh, to the EU. Uh, mostly is uh, completely uh, uh, um, uh, um, released from any uh, air, from any any um, and, 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 and any substance. The um, government council for cooperation uh, with uh, with NGOs that served an, as an example of multi stakeholder consultation, where you would have representatives from almost all governmental departments and um, 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 uh, a lot of civil society representatives. Uh, presenting different sectors like human rights, environmental protection, consumer protection, um, um, you name it, um, had uh, this forum where they could uh, talk and exchange on the important horizontal issues relevant for, uh, for civil society. This body is uh, not functioning. It's been overtaken by the government. The government has the majority over there. And in every and each uh, uh, instances, uh, when we have to um, um, make a decision, the civil society organizations are outnumbered and uh, outvoted. There are no regular, regular se sessions. This is this body is just a shell um, on a paper that government uh, uses to wave with it that it exists there but it's really not um, not um, not um, um, uh, functioning um we are still in the domain of civic participation and civic participation in croatia is deteriorating every um, every year significantly um 
we see that government is regularly uh, appoint, appointing obedient civil society organizations to working groups for the creation of the new uh, um, uh, legislation or um, um, uh, public uh, public policies. People are being chosen by uh, political closeness, not by uh, um, their expertise or their organization's expertise or representatives of of, of certain of certain issues. And that, and again, on the paper, everything is okay because they include civil society representatives but no one is looking at the uh, outcome and the quality of 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 that uh, tatima kvalitet svom rezultata toga postupka kada govorimo o o javnim uh, konzultacijama savjetovanjima i učešću javnosti uh, o javnim propisima uh, hrvatska je bila jako uh, ponosna na e savjetovanje ranije dakle svaki propisi treba predstavljati javnosti da svi građanci imali pravo komentirati i to je nešto što je sada postalo potpuno nebitno također zato što ne pruža mogućnost vođenja nekakvog konstruktivnog dijaloga gdje se može nešto bitno promijeniti u tome međutim to je zapravo nekakva kažem, tanka grančica na koje možemo reći da imamo određeni dialog ali se zapravo ništa uh, providing us with answers that they are taking into account our comments or that this is not part of 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 um, of, 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 of the of, of the consultation and in the past even before covid but covid use uh, was used again as a um, as a justification for it they completely uh, um, uh, run away from organizing anything publicly so they are afraid of people sitting with the people and having an honest conversation look this is good this is not good let's change this so everything let, let, let's just move away from um, from the people and the final proof in in this uh, uh, in the, uh, under this claim is that um, the government office for cooperation with ngos which is a uh, i'll say a, a, the most important institution when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, facilitating the relationship between the government and the citizens if you want um, is um, not deliver not delivering anything that is charged with um it is uh, responsible for um ruining all of this um all of these uh, uh, um, 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 platforms and instruments that i was uh, mentioning before on on public uh, participation and unfortunately it is run uh, by completely incompetent leadership that um, uh, is not able to bring um, any change or sustain the standards that were achieved during the 10 years of um, uh, negotiation and right now serves as a shame for the whole public administration in 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 Croatia the second claim um I, I i would like to present over here is that government is deliberately creating obedient service provisions uh, civil society that um uh, will not be at the position to do a watchdog criticize or uh, in any other way meaningfully participate in a policy uh, policy um, uh, creations um and there are numerous examples um, for it um the cso's were not meaningfully included in the preparation for the eu funds uh for the european social fund that is going to be available for creation for the next um, um a period again they were included on the paper but none of the ngos actually working in the fields of i don't know uh social inclusion discrimination you name it employment and 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 and, and other stuff um if they were included they were included almost at the end of the, the process of the process so basically the whole scheme for 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 financing was done um, uh, solely by the judgment of the um, um uh, governmental department so there was no civil so there was no genuine civil society um uh, participation um uh, participation um, in it uh that's on the eu level um and um the, the, what we see from the current examples is that the, the current scheme of the european social fund is being used solely to finance civil uh, uh, social service uh, provision basic social service provision so basically croatian government decided to uh use the eu money 
uh, uh, to uh, uh, provide its citizens social rights that were charged that that that, that we've been granted in our um, um, uh, constitution, um, which is misuse of that money because that money should be used for you know developing a better system, innovating of of making it more resilient in the future. But it poses an even bigger danger for um, the sustainability because what is going to happen in ten years when we will run out of the European social um, uh, of the European social funds? Not to say that it has a profound negative impact on the NGOs working in the social provision services because they don't have the opportunity to actually criticize um, um, uh, criticize the um, uh, the government. And the final point in that in that part is uh, there is no public funding, Croatian national public funding for human rights, watchdog, advocacy and research uh, uh, activities, um, which uh, is bad. The government would say, yeah, but we are funding that from the um, uh, from the um, uh, from the EU level. But the, the problems and, and the policy solutions doesn't start or end with the EU funding. You have to know what is happening on on, on on the ground, and you do that by enabling those that are closest to the problems and the, and the people in need uh, um, by bringing their problems to the decision making uh, places and 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 then spots. And the final claim um, uh, that I would like to uh, present over here today is that. Croatian government, arguably and very visibly, is having less and less policy capacity to create good, reasonable and change making policies and law. Like all the people since they joined the EU decided to leave the public service and went to Brussels. So that, that the salaries are much better there than in creation of a public service, which is part of the problem. But another part of the problem, which is enabling this, is that we are seeing more and more political capture of the institutions where political uh, uh, clients of the ruling party, which is ADZ, are without competence, are being put to the places where they have to decide. And this negative negative placement negative placement of people to to uh, uh, governing position is having a detrimental effect on how um, the professionals so the the, the long lasting bureaucrats long employed bureaucrats there with the institutional knowledge uh, uh, and skills um, are leaving their their places because it's it is becoming less and less uh, 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 um, viable to viable to work um, to work there. Uh, but on the policy level, Croatia is for seven years without main without main human rights policies uh, in uh, in the um, in the broader human rights and civil society uh, field. There is no human rights protection uh, program uh, and an uh, and anti-discrimination program. There is no gender equality policy, although the current one is is uh, is uh, is, uh, um, is just out from the public consultation. And most importantly, there is no civil society development uh, strategy. Something that Croatia had ever. Uh, I mean, it, it 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 looks like it's from ages when we are now talking uh, uh, about the EU civil society strategy. We had that what 20 years ago, like it was a really piloting thing and then and, and good examples. And instead of Croatian government right now going to the commission and saying, look, we have this great example. We know what we have real experience to share with you. They 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 have nothing to present because they completely um, uh, they completely um, 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 ruin uh, uh, ruin uh, ruin the system. Even when they uh, um, um, uh, present the, uh, the the policies uh, to the public when they are uh, developed, like the gender equality plan, honestly, it would be better they had they haven't done nothing, because what is a common denominator of all of these documents, because they are most of them are in in the, the work in progress, is that they have zero ambition, they have zero understanding of the problems that people and and, and are are facing on on the ground vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis. Um, uh, human rights and what they are doing is basically they are linking all of the activities that are going to be fund with the available EU programming in Brussels or with the available um, EU um, uh, EU um, EU funds and that will unfortunately not bring the change. These are the three 
broad um, issues. Uh, I deliberately haven't mentioned slaps, criminalization of, of, of solidarity, um, defamation of, of, uh, of, of human rights defenders and civil society organizations uh, in, um, in public because part of these uh, topics are going to be uh, covered later on during the, uh, the conferences. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivan, uh, for uh, this very uh, comprehensive uh, introduction. Um, uh, Croatian Civil Society uh, uh, 1, lesson first. Um, Okay, uh, we could hear uh, your insights in uh, uh, what is happening in uh, your countries. I wanted to, uh, uh, I, I had some uh, questions from you, uh, for you, but since we have uh, 17 minutes left, uh, I will now uh, read the question that we got uh, from uh, Anya from uh, our Ombudsman Initiative. Um, Anya says, uh, many thanks to the organizers and all the panelists uh, for these in-depth insights into CSO's civil society situations in Slovenia, Romania, Croatia, and my native Poland. Thank you, Malgorzata. Sadly, the threats to civil society, the rule of law, human rights, and civil liberties are clear, clearly uh, ve very similar across Europe. Uh, as you've, uh, you've uh, rightly observed, uh, given the magnitude of uh, civil rights violations in Poland and Hungary, the dangers to democracy and civil society in other EU countries are going practically unnoticed at the EU level. Do you see any effective way of uh, raising the alarm at the EU forum, uh, uh, EC, EP and others, about the threats to civil society and democracy across um, uh, Europe? I think uh, this might be a question for or all our uh, panelists. I, Jonut already said something about that, uh, but yeah, uh, whoever wants to... Oh, Jonut, Jonut uh, wants to answer. Actually, uh, all of us, we are part of some networks at the European Civic Forum, Civil Society Europe and so on. And they are doing a very good job in Brussels. So don't feel that uh, uh, you are neglected or forgotten. Uh, it's true that uh, the focus is on uh, on uh, Hungary and Poland because it has the contagious effect. If we lose totally the the fight there, uh, then <laughs> uh, other 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 heads of government will see that it's possible. So it's key. Um, but where I think the 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 donors, some donors didn't understand is that uh, it shouldn't focus. Just just on these two countries, that it should, you know, have a regional approach and uh, uh, save what is to be saved in in uh, in uh, uh, other countries where these tendencies are obvious and you have ups and downs year by year. Another issue that it's a great importance is the elections, and I think here we should see, also with the help with with our colleagues from Brussels, how we could find a recipe to work better during the elections and to galvanize the society uh, to have our voice heard to be heard to be influenced and to be able to convince people you know about their liberal tendencies you know and to to stamp those tendencies so now we are very keen to see our colleagues from Poland they are I know they are organizing it we are trying to 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 to, to see how they are doing and to 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 create a model as we have done it in with uh, monitoring the election with the American help. I mean, we should re-do uh, uh, this process uh, uh, at the European level in order, because elections are the key. If we lose that, then we have four miserable years always. So that's the key moment that we should we should perform better. We should get the trust of the, the, the people better in, in Romania and in and, and, and Poland, Czech, Slovakia, Czech Republic, where they have where we had uh, big waves of, of, uh, of uh, uh, um, migrants from Ukraine and we deliver and now we have the acknowledgement and the support of, of population and uh, some like minded politician. We could uh, uh, build on it. Um, 
Thank you, Jonat. Uh, Jonat, maybe Malgorzata or Ivan or uh, Barbara could also say something about their um, past experiences with the EU advocacy. For example, how rule of law reporting uh, is, it, it, do, do you see it uh, useful? What can change? Uh, how can we use the solidarity networks and European networks uh, that we have? Maybe our representatives uh, at the European Economic and uh, Social Committee. So what are your uh, views uh, on this? Um, Ivan? Um, well, just briefly, I, I think it is it is really important to uh, for us to be in touch with networks in in Brussels. They can be a tremendous asset in in uh, for facilitating our access to the corridors of of the EU institutions and 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 policy making um, um, decision. And it is important that we uh, inform them about um, every single you know bad situation that that or change that happened in, in in our context because it is important for them to recognize the trends as well. That 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 makes it easier to bring something to the attention of the of the uh, of the policy makers. But I think that this is not the only avenue. I think we also have to find a way, means and platforms to collaborate transnationally without Brussels. I mean, with them, you know, being present on what is happening. But we have to start communic communicating uh, uh, as societies bilaterally, trilaterally, and then multilaterally. Um, because our experience, Croatian experience with, um, uh, with, 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 with how to say, framing our reaction to 2016 in Croatia was uh, enormously helped by the experience from um, uh, Poland and, and, and Hungary. I remember, Gosha, you coming to Zagreb, we had that in, in, in the parliament, but what we heard then from um, uh, from you and and from the colleagues from from Hungary helped us to see where that you know uh, uh, tendencies and policies can um, um, uh, can um, um, uh, can uh, can lead. Um, the third point is that um, EU is um, it's evolving. It's it's slow. It's uh, it's big, and you know it it, it takes time. Um, we have to criticize it in a way that, uh, and then to say it clearly, it is much better when it comes to understanding deficiencies in democracy and rule of law and human rights uh, outside. I mean, we don't have to go to Serbia, Bosnia or, or Macedonia. We can say that from Croatian um, um, experience. But for me, it was always a puzzle, like how the uh the eu officials that work in 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 dg near or in the uh um, um, representations of the eu in skopje and in belgrade know exactly what to write about civic space access to finding they actually know how to use the term human rights defender and human rights you know all of the, these things that the eu officials when working internally all of a the sudden, they don't know what to do it. I mean, I, I'm always perplexed when I hear from the EU officials the wording, but we don't know what are the standards when it comes to um, to civil society, I mean, meaning to, uh, human rights um, uh, standards. So the EU, as every bureaucracy, has this uh, tendency to create a new, uh, the same job for itself. So we have to be pushy about EU creating standards for um, 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 for itself. And the rule of law is really important in, in, in that regard, uh, rule of law report of the commission. It is a fairly new mechanism. I think it's the fourth iteration um, um, uh, this year, but you can see the slow progress that is, um, um, that is making. At the first year, uh, we couldn't imagine recommendations uh, coming out from the Commission. Right now, we have them. They are far from perfect. Honestly, UPR recommendation to the Belarus has more concreticity in it than uh, the, the, the last ones for, for Croatia. But OK, we'll get to there. It's just the opportunity for us to, to push it and to, uh, to make it more uh, um, 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 uh, useful. And I think there is a the, the, there is a key of what Jonut said uh, to it. We have to uh, uh, bring the numbers in. We have to find the way to mobilize our national civil society and have more uh, uh, inputs to the commission because obviously commission reacts only to numbers.
Thank you, uh, Ivan. I think that Janusz has a reaction to your intervention. 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention Fundamental Rights Agency, FRA. You will have Val speaking mm -hmm. in your conference. It's a key institution. We should invest more on FRA. Uh, FRA delivered a, a lady in relation with us, with their reports. They pushed civil society and shrinking civic space to the agenda of European Commission. You know, it's once and me and Ivan and you are going to talk with Europe is another issue when it's coming to FRA, the same message. So uh, this is one of, of the messages I want to give it to you today. Don't forget about FRA and don't forget about ESE, European Economic and Social Committee. Of course, now from some of your countries, they are not NGOs uh, appointed. They are, you know, uh, representatives of the government under the cover of an NGO, but we have a great report, you know, with uh, setting some standards that some of us worked after the previous election. 2025 is the renewal. Let's have a campaign, a European campaign in sending in ESE, you know, qualified people, civic activists. Otherwise, the, the institution is irrelevant if you are not there and fight for it. We are very few that we, 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 we speak uh, the language we are speaking here. Uh, thank you, Jonat. I have uh, have to agree uh, with you on uh, uh, FRA. Uh, even in connection to rule of law uh, report, I could see that our reporting in uh, civic space uh, report uh, to FRA uh, uh, is maybe more successful in entering rule of law uh, report than when when we uh, report uh, directly to the European Commission. Uh, Barbara. Uh, so I hope that the EU will uh, realize that the wind of change from the east is very dangerous and that it will not stop at the Berlin Wall. Uh, I'm not very involved in European networks, but in recent years I have uh, attended several meetings with high-ranking representatives of EU institutions. And must, uh, I must say that I was often very worried after the meetings because it seemed to me that they were only formally performing their duty. And their eyes, heads and also hearts were quite empty after the meeting as well. Um, I think that the Slovenian case will be very interesting because it will show how much desire um, is there on the national and European level to strengthen civil society also in times when democracy is not under direct attack, uh, attack by uh, illiberal forces. So uh, I think very important uh, times are in, uh, ahead of us. And um, maybe mm -hmm. if I may just add to that and coming back to the question from the audience, um, I think the problem with the EU advocacy is that uh, the EU institutions, I think, has a pretty good grasp of the problem, thanks to, for example, FRA reports and ongoing um, calls coming from the civil society organizations. But what makes it very, very difficult are two things. The first thing is that there is lack of urgency. So I guess those institutions always operate under the impression that they still have time. And hey, if there are some CSOs, activists still coming to Brussels, what's the problem? And the second thing is that um, there is not that easily translatable interest into that. So it's not like, for example, crash on financial markets when that can uh, create a hu huge political impact. Um, or certain huge political changes that, uh, that can happen that would create, uh, the, like the gravity for the problem here. And I think that the, the latter problem is the struggle for us, how to build a narration about the problem to, um, uh, to, uh, oh, explain this to the policymakers that although we don't have that immediate, uh, and attached to that very, very concrete bunch of interests, like financial interests, for example, um, imagine the, the world, the EU without the civil society. And 
I remember four or five years ago, special UN special reporter on freedom of assemblies and associations. He published a report, Imagine the World Without the Civil Society. And that was some sort of a good um, narration scheme that we could further um, um, discover or develop in that, uh, in that regard. But I'm also quite pessimistic about the whole based communication on all of that. <laughs> I, I think that we still haven't reached that stage. And I think it's absolutely important and crucial to document uh, the violations for for the freedom of assemblies and freedom of associations. So um, I guess that uh, that before the EU institutions catch up with us, we still have a lot of work to do. So a lot of pressure on our side. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, uh, Gosa. I think that uh, with your intervention, we came to the end of this. Um, uh, panel, uh, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and insights. Uh, I think uh, we could uh, hear uh, uh, that there are so many similarities in our context, but also some uh, differences and that we can really learn from each other, but not just learn from each other, but also uh, should uh, take more uh, common uh, initiatives. Uh, and as uh, Jonut said, we will have some opportunities next year during the elections and then uh, the year later, uh, I think, when we have a European um, Economic and Social um, uh, Committee uh, uh, elections. Uh, I hope we uh, we stay in touch. I hope you uh, you could stay at uh, some of uh, the um, other uh, panels. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of work uh, work to do. Um, thank you. We will start the next panel in uh, 15 uh, minutes, so 11.45. Uh, we will talk about uh, slabs, uh, so see you soon. Thank you. I wish a warm welcome to everybody who participated at the first panel of our conference, Countering Shrinking Civil Space and creating an enabling environment for civil society in the EU. But I also welcome everybody who just uh, joined us now. I was just, uh, I also welcome, of course, our panelists. And thank you for finding time for to, to be here. Uh, I will just uh, shortly switch to uh, Croatian, uh, just to give some uh, technical uh, instructions. Dobar dan svima za one Hello once again, and prijevod po samo pogledajte na dnu ekrana imate jedan globus i piše interpretation tako da se možete uključiti na hrvatski kanal. I sad ću se prebaciti opet na engleski. Uh, so, hello everybody again. Uh, I'm Jeka Leila Gracin, uh, and I will today be uh, in two, two roles. One is to facilitate this uh, panel on SLEPS as a tool against civil society organizations and activists. But I will also speak a bit about, about um, our cases. Uh, and when we were designing uh, this whole conference and this panel, uh, it was actually really easy uh, to select uh, Zelena Akcia as, um, as being a um, facilitator of this uh, panel, because unfortunately we have been slept. Uh, I think that uh, first when we were slept, we didn't even know uh, what is what is slept, what this, uh, uh, this is uh, shortened for, but then uh, we quickly realized that uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation is something uh, that we are uh, facing and in uh, uh, several years, and I would say especially in the last five years, this is some kind of uh, trend uh, in, in Croatia. Uh, before uh, we start uh, going deeply in this uh, topic, I just want to tell you that during um, uh, all uh, introduction part from our panelists, which I will uh, uh, present in a, in a minute, 
you have a Q and A uh, also in the um, uh, at your computer. You can uh, ask questions or have some comments uh, during the during the um, introduction part. But of course, uh, also after you hear introduction parts, you can you can ask. I'm really sorry that uh, we are not able to allow in-person questions, but as you can see, we have only hour and 15 minutes for this very big topic. And uh, actually, uh, this was mentioned from all the panelists which were with us uh, at the first panel. So uh, this is surely a topic which, which we have chosen well. But we have to have uh, we have to have save some time uh, at least to scratch about uh, this topic. So now I, I welcome uh, all of uh, our panelists uh, today. We have with us Maya Sever, uh, which is uh, from European Federation of Journalists and Croatian Journalists Union. Welcome, Maya. Then we have uh, Nora uh, Vehovic. I hope that I pronounce it at least uh, nearly. Uh, nearly as I supposed to, uh, uh, who is from Human Rights House Foundation, and uh, Charlie Holt, uh, who is from Coalition Against Slaps in Europe case, about which you will uh, hear more later, and uh, also from Greenpeace. Before uh, they will give some introduction uh, part, I will also uh, shortly represent what they do, but if I will miss something, uh, I ask for all the panelists to, to fit in because uh, if they want to emphasize something else. So about uh, shortly, if that is even possible, uh, about situation in, uh, in Croatia about slabs and uh, our experience in Zelen Aksia, uh, I have to, I had to prepare uh, for this conference to choose uh, from some cases because not only that there were lawsuits uh, launched against us, but uh, also some uh, media were uh, trying to, uh, were, were writing uh, really horrible stuff about us, about our campaigns. And also we were facing some problems with, um, uh, with our facilities in, in Zagreb, uh, because when you have, when you are really loud and when you are uh, doing your job properly, I would say, as an activist organization, that then you are not only facing lawsuits, but all kinds of problems uh, from the government of different levels, which just want to make your your uh, work harder, and uh, who who just want to um, take some of your time to deal with a different kind of uh, problems against you, and not real dealing with the campaign which you are uh, doing uh, and just uh, uh, in in a lot of uh, a lot of manners to not only make your uh, job harder but just to, to give you some other tasks uh, which with which you you have to deal if you want to um, uh, if you want to keep your organization going on uh, for today uh, i will just mention uh, the first lab uh, which we were facing it it happened in 2019 and it was um, because of our really small street performance it was not even a public gathering or a protest and we had a, a performance in front of the building of the ministry of environment and after that the ministry decided uh, to to sue us and there was a threat with a really big uh, charge uh, that we um, violated uh, law on um, uh, law on waste, which was really funny because we were actually protesting uh, that uh, against the government that we didn't have any regulation about paints and uh, varnishes. So we were protesting to to push them to issue regulation, and then at the end we were facing uh, this big charge uh, that we violated the, the law on waste. Uh, and uh, at that time, um, uh, uh, we realized what is being slapped and not by the uh, some kind of investor, which is, I would say, uh, more common in slaps, but we were sued by the ministry. 
uh, and but the the funny thing then uh, was that a lot of uh, a lot of international uh, networks and also um, uh, human rights organizations in our uh, country were all very, really supportive and we also got uh, free legal aid uh, so uh, at the end we didn't have to pay anything and we proved that we didn't uh, violate any law. Uh, the, the other case, which is still unfortunately going on and really for a long time now, we, we were, uh, we are facing criminal charges against the uh, three responsible, uh, persons from the Anaxia, me being included in that. And we were sued by a, a investor in golf courses in Serge near Dubrovnik. Uh, and saying that, um, that we, uh, uh, that because of our campaign, uh, and on uh, billboards, which we, uh, which we had, uh, near Dubrovnik, uh, that we, uh, uh, we will make, uh, look them bad. It's really funny. I, I cannot say that in, uh, in other way, but, uh, they, uh, it's going on for so many years and it's really expensive. Uh, but, uh, for now on, they didn't even, uh, try to seriously prove what uh, they are saying. Uh, also, it's not, uh, this kind of, uh, slaps are not, uh, happening only to, to Zelen Arts, only to my organization. And I think, um, it's even worse when you are, uh, one activist, uh, without some kind of security being in the, in a, in an organization who can support you financially and in other ways. So I will just mention case of, uh, Nikola Tesla, which is, it's a real name. Uh, and, uh, he is, um, uh, activist, uh, from, a, a place called, <clears throat> Uh, and he was fighting against illegal uh, landfill near his uh, house, and actually he succeeded in everything what uh, uh, what he was fighting against. But uh, but during this fight, he uh, he launched uh, several lawsuits against the municipality and a and a communal uh, company. But unfortunately, he lost, and then he faced uh, a, a eighty-six thousand kunas uh, charge. So he had to pay because uh, because he lost the case. Uh, I'm mentioning this case because uh, Zelen Aksia was also uh, supporting him because uh, we launched a campaign to gather uh, money that he can uh, that he can pay these uh, these charges. This fines, uh, but, uh, and we succeeded. Uh, but, uh, I would like our panelists later, uh, after introduction part only, uh, also to maybe mention, uh, in what ways we can, uh, support, uh, activists, uh, fighting slaps and maybe we have to think about creating some kind of solidarity fund. Uh, because uh, even for Zelen Axia, who is a large organization and has a, uh, substantial uh, financial support, it is really hard to find um, even money to go to court and to pay the lawyers. Uh, and uh, then you can just imagine how it is for one uh, one individual uh, who is facing all of that uh, all by uh, himself. Uh, so not, not taking, uh, I already took a, a bit more time for introduction, but I, as I said, I'm, uh, also, uh, a speaker and not only a facilitator. I welcome again, uh, our panelists and the, the first one who will, uh, who will uh, talk a bit more, uh, is Nora, uh, Vekovic, uh, who is the international advocacy officer of, uh, House of the Human Rights Foundation. And it's a uh, Brussels representative. Uh, she works to advance human rights house foundations, uh, human rights objectives at the European level with a focus on uh, European Union and the Council of uh, Europe. Uh, Nora will, uh, house of the human rights foundation is also member of, uh, case coalition. So, uh, you will, uh, shortly present, uh, what is case all about. 
uh, and also then uh, took over to to talk about uh, to to talk about a bit more about human rights defenders situation uh, in the Europe. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you all understand me. Uh, thank you very much, Sakya. And um, thank you also for starting with your own testimony and other case examples. I think uh, here we already see um, and they already show many elements of slap lawsuits and the impacts um, slap lawsuits can have. Maybe I uh, start coming back to a description of slaps. Um, what are slaps? Slaps are abusive lawsuits filed with the purpose of shutting down acts of public participation, including public interest journalism, peaceful protest, also whistleblowers can be affected, um, or basically anyone speaking out against the abuse of power. Uh, they are mostly filed by powerful individuals, including politicians and companies, to silence any critiques by tying them up in costly and time-consuming litigation. The goal, um, and I think that's important to mention, is not always to win the case, but, and I think that we already heard that in the examples, to intimidate and, and bind resources. So um, here we also have the chilling effect for others because maybe others are afraid uh, picking up sensitive issues as they know that they cannot afford legal costs and the time it's consuming and are also afraid of the psychological effects slaps may have. Um, as I already said, SLAPs target basically anyone who work to hold powerful to account, so um, public watchdogs engaging in matters of public interest. This includes journalists, activists, environmental and human rights defenders, whistleblowers, NGOs, trade unions, but also academics. What impact does that have? Um, we can say that SLAPs really, uh, on a broader level, weaken democracy by preventing civil society organizations and individuals from engaging in public debate. And it also has then an effect on um, the exercise of uh, freedom of expression, but also freedom of assembly and association. So um, SLAPs are kind of, yeah, on a, on a broader level, a threat to democracy, but can also be a threat to uh, the rule of law and the effective enforcement of law and hinder legal protection of rights under a respective law. So um, what do we do against it? What is CASE? The Coalition Against Slaps in Europe, CASE, is a coalition of very diverse non-governmental organizations from different fields. So we have environmental organizations, journalists uh, organizations, human rights organizations, academics from across Europe who recognize the threat um, posed by slaps against public watchdogs and also the increasing trends of slaps across Europe. Uh, CASE has a threefold approach. Firstly, we want to expose legal harassment in form of slaps and those who use them. Secondly, we want to build resilience against slaps and also protect or at least support the protection of those who speak out. And thirdly, we want to advocate for law reform and comprehensive protective measures. CASE also documents cases. Between 2019 and 2021, CASE collected data on apparent slaps filed between 2010 and 2021. And we identified over 500 verified slap cases across Europe. And this number is kind of firstly growing and second of all, kind of a gray number because many slap victims do not know about the phenomenon as such. So they are not even aware that the case against them um, could be recognized and, and documented as a slap case. And second of all, many are also afraid to um, speak out and prefer not to draw attention to their lawsuit. So um, uh, there might be many more than, than these cases we have documented. We also see in the documentation that especially environmental organizations and activists and investigative journalists seem particularly threatened. Um, to also, I mentioned, uh, to expose uh, uh, Europe's uh, worst slap uh, bullies and plaintiffs, um, we, as the Case Coalition, for the second time this year, held the European Slap Contest, which um, awards an anti-slap award to those uh, bullies. What is Case doing? Um, we campaign on an international level. I said we, we advocate really for uh, law reform and better protection. Uh, and on EU level, since 2019, several case members have been pushing for 
uh, EU directive on slabs. Um, after pressure by the European Parliament, it was picked up by the Commission, who then presented legislative and non-legislative measures in early 2022. Charlie Holt, who sits in the case steering committee and here um, is with us here today, will go more into details um, after me. Um, and then besides the EU, we also push on the Council of Europe level because um, slabs, of course, don't stop at the EU borders. In fact, they occur domestically, of course, around the world and have also often cross-border nature across Europe. So, for example, if an oligarch from Russia sues a journalist from Serbia in the UK. So, in March 2021... Um, on the Council of Europe level, 103 organizations signed a statement urging the Council of Europe to issue guidance to its member states on how to combat slaps. And um, we were quite successful in this campaign. In November 2021, the Committee of Ministers decided to establish a committee of experts on slaps and tasked it with a drafting of a recommendation of, of slaps on slabs for the member states of the Council of Europe. And this recommendation is now being drafted um, and will hopefully be issued by the end of 2023. Meanwhile, also at Council of Europe level, a motion has been tabled, uh, which hopefully leads to the adoption of a resolution on slabs by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, PACE. And this is important because we want to show that this is, again, not only a problem within the EU, but we also see slab cases in Armenia, for example, which then is a Council of Europe member state. Um, and PACE also recognized that it's really high time for European countries to put in place efficient anti-slap measures. Um, then on an international level, also at the UN, the issue of slaps is being recognized as a growing threat against freedom of expression and other fundamental freedoms affecting human rights defenders, environmental activists, and so on, and fundamental rights in general. Um, we as the case coalition say that the measures in any recommendations and directives, be it the EU, the Council of Europe or the UN, must involve all sorts of public participation and target domestic as well as cross-border cases. But we can maybe come back later to the key elements the case coalition hopes to be included, for example, in the EU directive. Charlie will again also talk about that. Um, and I think uh, um, it's of course, important to recognize that even though states are um, kind of having a positive obligation to counter slaps and provide protection against slaps uh, being committed to human rights protection, of course, any directive, any recommendation needs the political will for national implementation. Um, and especially in countries where we see a problematic judiciary, maybe it's not as independent, international um, directives may risk of not being fully implemented on national level um, so uh, that they kind of don't follow our original intentions in this protection. And maybe we can come back to, to that later in the discussion, um, how to yeah, make sure that um, national implementation takes place and how we can also monitor that. Um, to clarify, I think that is an argument which often comes up. Uh, fighting slaps doesn't mean that we want to limit the possibility to make legitimate claims against, for example, defamation. Of course, this must still be possible. But just to make clear, it's really about a misuse of, for example, defamation, but also anti-extremism laws, and to recognize these as such. Um, if here amongst the audience are people who maybe have like lawsuits, for example, defamation lawsuits against them, but are not so sure if it fits the definition of slabs, I just want to say, uh, go on the case website. It's uh, de-case.eu. There's also a tool by Index on Censorship developed for journalists. It's available in several languages, how to identify a slab. So this is maybe useful for, for some of you. Uh, I stop here as an intro and I'm happy to come back later and I hand over uh, back to you or to Charlie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nora. Uh, I think that uh, I also uh, especially uh, thank you for inviting people to to see if uh, what is uh, happening to them, is it a slap or, or not? And uh, I think that they also can get a lot of ideas how to seek uh, assistance if uh, uh, something like that is uh, happening to them, uh, to them. So thank you and 
yeah, we will get to back to to you a bit later. Uh, now uh, we will have uh, Charlie uh, Holt, uh, who is a legal counsel for campaigns at uh, Greenpeace International, uh, where he leads the organization SLAP Resilience Strategy. Thank you for, for that and thank you for being here. Uh, until 2019, uh, his work was uh, focused on US, uh, where he worked uh, on two aggressive large-scale uh, uh, SLAPs uh, targeting Greenpeace and helped set up the anti-slap coalition, uh, protect the protest. He is now uh, working on building slap resilience in Europe through the coalition against slaps in Europe uh, case, which was presented by Nora. Uh, Charlie uh, will give us the introduction of, uh, and to talk a bit more about EU directive, uh, which was uh, mentioned. And it was, uh, I would say, really, really welcomed by a lot of activists and journalists uh, at, at, at last as some kind of um, showing the will uh, from the EU to, to face, to recognize the problem with slabs. Uh, and yeah, Charlie will now uh, tell us a bit more about the, about the content. So Charlie, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to be here uh, today, uh, I think. One thing that organizations on the Greenpeace Network and organizations in the Friends of the Earth community have long had in common is SLAPS. And it's a, a real pleasure to be here and to, to share some of our experiences. Um, I am, as you said, going to focus on, on CASE and the way that we've been working. And, and as Nora has already said, I'm going to be really focusing on our advocacy work and specifically on the EU directive. But very briefly, it's just worth uh, saying that the Coalition Against SLAPS in Europe is made up of three different working groups. There's an advocacy working group, a campaign working group, and a legal resilience, a work working group that works on, on legal resilience. And all of these are sort of quite active and have their own objectives that they're pursuing. Uh, the advocacy working group very broadly has as an objective to, um, to, to advance anti-slap solutions across Europe. So as Nora has already said, you know, Europe there is defined geographically, so we're not limited by the EU. And that's why the Council of Europe is such an important part of our advocacy work. And obviously also we're, there, we're then looking at individual European countries and ensuring that they have each have robust protections in place against slaps. The reason the directive, the EU directive, is such an important part of this work is because, of course, it would be a means of fast tracking that on each for each individual member state, because our focus would shift from, you know, it, it, ensuring that each country has its own uh, uh, campaign in place to really just focusing on the transposition of EU law into domestic law. Um, that is uh, a, a why, I mean, an increasing, either way, an increasing an important part of our advocacy work has been on a national level and a central priority for case has therefore been the formation of working groups across Europe. Um, we've seen a number of them being formed in the last year. There are now working groups existing in Italy, Poland, uh, uh, Germany, the UK, Spain, Netherlands, uh, and France. Although I have to say with France that their working group, their coalition predates CASE. And uh, there's a coalition there called On Essai de Repa, which was set up in 2018. But this has been a really important part of the moment, due in part to this proposed EU directive. And I'll explain more about that in the process in a bit. But first of all, just a bit of background. So CASE first called for an EU directive in early 2020, uh, when we published a policy paper outlining what we thought needed to be done on an EU level to uh, address definitively the problem of slaps. Um, this policy paper was followed up in December of 2020, when we published a model law, um, I'll, I'll put a link in this later on after this, but the model law uh, really went into detail about what an ideal anti-slap directive would look like and the provisions it would contain. Um, and this was followed up in the same month, December 2020, when the European Commission published its Democracy Action Plan, which included then a commitment to act on SLAPs. And it also included the formation of an expert group on SLAPs within the European Commission. This expert group worked throughout 2021. And in early 2022, earlier this year, the European Commission published its directive. It, sorry, that was in June of this year. 
the the directive, the proposed directive by the European Commission was something that we we very much welcomed at the time, while also recognizing where it fell short. We've now published a full analysis of it. Again, I'll publish this, put this a, li a link afterwards, and we have a, a shorter analysis, just a one-page analysis, which we've been using for advocacy purposes. Very briefly, this contained many of the core components, if not all the core components, that we recognized as being included in any effective anti-slap law. Um, in short, we can characterize any effective anti-slap law as, as trying to advance three main objectives. So first of all, they try to, uh, and it, they dispose or they, they have measures to dispose of slaps as soon as they reach court. So that means a sort of early dismissal mechanism, one which effectively filters slaps out of the court process so that the harm they cause through the litigation process can be minimized. The second thing they do is they minimize costs for those being targeted by slaps. And finally, they include sanctions against those who use slaps, therefore making sure that we can deter the use of slaps and ensure they don't become more of a problem. Um, the, the draft directive includes covers all of these or advances all of these objectives. So it includes an early dismissal mechanism. It also includes related safeguards, such as stay, such as the stay of proceedings um, pending resolution of that uh, case and an accelerated procedure, as well as a reversed burden of proof when it comes to actually arguing for the anti-slap motion. It includes protective measures, including security for costs and a full award of costs against slap claimants when a case is dis dismissed and finally compensation for damages when it is dismissed and thirdly and finally it includes dissuasive sanctions and these are provided for via uh, what is quote effective proportionate and dissuasive penalties and this is really important because as nora said a lot of the time most of the time when we're talking about slaps they're filed by very wealthy claimants and individuals so it's important that 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 power that power dynamic is taken into account when sanctions are imposed. So this is broad, all very broadly uh, encouraging. Two things I'd note very quickly about this, which are, are fairly important. The first one is that the proposed directive has a very broad understanding of what constitutes a cross-border case. Now, this is important because the European Union is limited in its competence when it comes to civil law matters to dealing with, with cross-border matters. The question is how you define cross-border. If this was a very narrow definition, simply meaning parties, two parties domiciled in different member states, then it would be a very limited anti-slap law. But as it, as it is worded, the proposed directive encompasses matters um, or, or lawsuits which target uh, wh uh, where the subject matter of that lawsuit is relevant to two or more member states. And that's very important. <laughs> the second thing I'd note about it, or rather I just also note that is that is an inherent limitation of the directive, but it's one which is, is minimized through this. Um, the second thing I'd note is, is, is another innovation in the directive, which is done to address some of the criticism about this potentially impeding access to justice, which is that the draft, the proposed directive splits the concept of, of slaps into two. So it has abusive proceedings against public participation on one hand and manifestly unfounded lawsuits against public participation on the other hand. And these are then accorded different, different sorts of protection, different layers of protection. This is something that we have said should be, um, should be avoided because it are, it's an artificial divide. All slaps are ultimately abusive and all slaps should therefore be subject to the same measures. I've got two, two minutes. I'm going to quickly finish up just by saying, talking very briefly about the process. This text is now being reviewed in both the European Parliament and the European Council. Now, in order for this to become law, there has to both all three institutions have to reach consensus about the text. We're expecting the European Parliament to produce a report on the proposed measures in March and then to vote on it in June. Now, this timetable is likely to change, but that's at present where it is. At that point, the different institutions will enter an inter-institutional negotiation, what's called a trialogue between the three different institutions. And I'll just finish by saying this, which is that 
The real challenge we expect will come from the European Council, that is, from the member states themselves. We already know that there are a number of countries in the um, in the European Union who are skeptical, if not hostile, to some of these measures, namely because specifically because in some of these countries it is the politicians themselves who are using slaps against their critics. So it's really important, therefore, that we ramp up pressure on the individual member states. And this goes back to what I was saying before about the national working groups and why they're so crucial, because we really need to be working on the member states themselves. So I would just say this to anyone listening, and of course, when it comes to Croatia too, there is a fantastically strong anti-SAP community in Croatia. And, and that is really encouraging. And I think we now have a broad anti-SLAP community across Europe that goes beyond CASE. CASE is just helping to coordinate and facilitate the formation of that community. So if anyone is interested in getting involved in this and helping to set up work uh, national working groups, please do get in touch. CASE is there to support and to help. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Charlie. Uh yeah, I mean, it's. I knew that uh, uh, the introduction part and the timing for introduction part is really short for all of you because all of our speakers uh, could uh, talk for hours about it, unfortunately. Uh, and I would be more happy that, uh, and a bit, this is today with a focus to talk about the future and, like you said, anti uh, working on anti slack mechanisms and coalitions because, yeah, we have to. Uh, find the right tools in in future to to fight against it because yeah it will not disappear. Uh, so we will get back to you later. Now we will uh, come back to uh, to Croatia and uh, now Maya Maya Sever who I I hope and uh, I hope all well, most of our participants uh, know. Uh, she is the head of the Croatian uh, Croatian Journalist Union. And in 2022, she has been elected president of European Federation of Journalists. Uh, congrats again on, on that. Uh, being the first woman at that position, which I think is really, really great. Unfortunate that you are the first one, but yeah, you, I hope that uh, this is a, a, that you are opening a new chapter. Uh, I would say that Maya is uh, well known uh, not only as a journalist in Croatia, but also as a really uh, brave and open um, activist. So uh, for me, it was no surprise, and I believe for others too, that you announced that your presidency will uh, focus, among other things, on the saf safety of journalists and the fight uh, against slap lawsuits. Uh, and um, yeah, like Nora presented and Charlie spoke about that. Although we are today a bit more focused on slap, uh, slaps against the uh, um, activists, uh, you are more than aware how slaps are uh, really some kind of trend in Croatia against journalists. Uh, and yeah, I hope that you will briefly give us some overall situation. Uh, and probably will also mention that uh, on this slap contest, uh, Croatia already won, uh, if I'm correct, twice. So, yeah, the, the floor is yours, Maya. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Yes, I will focus on uh, uh, slaps uh, against journalists uh, in media environment. Uh, it's a very big uh, threat, in, uh, not just in Croatia, all around the Europe. But uh, Croatia is a winner. Yes, uh, on this uh, conference of uh, case coalition a uh, few weeks ago, um, our Bon Judge Bonko Verban uh, was announced as a, a winner, uh, as a bully, uh, he's a judge. And uh, first of all, I want to say that I cooperate with uh, Charlie. I listen in the meetings of Case Coalition, and they all are really great. I, I really adore them because they have so energy and I think that the Gate Coalition made such a great uh, 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 job. Um, and uh, Charlie is aware that Croatia is a very big problem. For years, the pressure on journalists with slaps. Uh, 
here in Croatia has not weakened. Uh, when I talk to my colleagues uh, in Croatia about the attacks and pressures uh, which bother them, many of them, perhaps most of them, uh, said that they deal somehow with threats and insults and attacks even easier than with pressure of uh, lawsuits. Uh, slaps really deeply burden and threaten free journalists in Croatia. Not only because uh, uh, editors and uh, or owners and journalists are afraid uh, if they lo uh, lose uh, lawsuits, uh, they can they can close door of their newsrooms, uh, shut down the newspaper. Uh, but even if they have funds to pay uh, court costs. Uh, journalists and editors waste days and days waiting in some court corridors uh, for uh, a process to uh, 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 start and the uh, colleagues are really exhausted and it becomes pointless, especially because uh, a lot of these lawsuits are filled because of some uh, real quotes or they publish ordinary facts. And according to uh, to uh, these uh, bullets, I could say, uh, it caused mental pain and uh, uh, they decided to sue the journalists. Uh, uh, so we here in Croatia expected a lot of, the, of uh, directive and recommendations because uh, Croatia, uh, in Croatia, we, we're really witnessing a systematic and in institutional uh, uh, threat and, uh, uh, against journalists. Uh, and of course, it's always from certain members of our societies, so-called establishment, uh, named in such a way due to their uh, answered privileged treatment, resort to such actions and that can only be called censorship. Uh, and I must say, I have to admit now here that Ministry of Culture and Media um, start and open some kind of cooperation. Last year, they established working group uh, for SLAP in which uh, our representatives of unions and associations, they also particip participate. Uh, it's Dusan Milius and uh, Susan Lepen from uh, Croatian Association of Journalists. Um, and also uh, even uh, uh, in public, representative of uh, Ministry of Culture and Me Media announced that they will include a provision on early dismissal uh, in the new um, law about media, media law. Uh, and now we are waiting. Unfortunately, I spoke with uh, Jelena Berkovic uh, yesterday or day before, and uh, uh, she mentioned that uh, there is no, uh, 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 she, she couldn't find when this media law will be uh, on the board of the government and the parliament. So I hope, I, I'm afraid that uh, we will wait, but I can also um, uh, uh, even emphasize that uh, this mentioning that uh, they um, they want to accept early dismissal, it's one step further for us in Croatia. Uh, but still, there is no official definition of slap in Croatia, and no, and, uh, no nor do cards single out and classify such a, a lawsuit. And but currently, there is at least uh, uh, 951 lawsuits active in Croatia against journalists and the media, uh, from which the prosecutors are demanding uh, the amount of almost uh, 10 million and 300,000 uh, kunas damages. Uh, and it's according to the results of a survey conducted uh, for the fourth year in a row by uh, Croatian uh, Journal Association. Um, Maybe if you give me permission, I can share even uh, uh, some uh, picture. Uh, I but but okay, doesn't matter. I will put uh, these pictures uh, about these data in chat so uh, uh, you can see there. Uh, what I want to say that um, uh, just last year, Hansa Media, uh, their publisher of Utrecht Globus Global Slobodna Dalmatia. Uh, they had a uh, highest number of lawsuits, uh, 443 of them, uh, with, uh, with an average amount of demanded damages of uh, uh, 12, more than 12,000 uh, euros per lawsuit. Styria uh, has uh, 196 lawsuits 
just for their publication patron release and by the city chat restata. With the total number of demanded damages amounting of uh, like uh, two and a half million. In active litigation, uh, the amount of claims in lawsuits range for several uh, thousand kunas for over one million kunas, but the longest uh, litigation has been active for 30, 32 years uh, at uh, the current moment. Uh, of the total of uh, 1951 lawsuits, uh, uh, 951 lawsuits, uh, 928 related to litigation for damages of uh, um, intimidated of owner and reputation and uh, lead against publishers, the editors and journalists themselves uh, for published texts and uh, articles. Uh, in other hand, uh, there are 23 criminal proceedings currently active. Apart from natural persons are known to general public, prosecutors are most often persons from public and political life, very known in our uh, um, uh, society including politic, uh, politicians in uh, power, followed by the legal entities, but also judges. So, as you mentioned, the uh, winner of a case coalition uh, uh, content was uh, one judge from Osijek, Zvonko Verban. Um, well, thanks point to a large number of these lawsuits being uh, aimed uh, at uh, intimidating the media and encouraging censorship and self-censorship among journalists, which is shown by the amount of initial lawsuits in civil proceedings, often much higher than uh, those that have been confirmed uh, by a final uh, judicial verdict. Official data from Ministry of Justice shows that uh, 380 new lawsuits for damages were in, uh, against journalists last year. And as of December, of the end of uh, 20, uh, uh, last year, a uh, total of uh, 858 lawsuits have not yet been resolved. The total number of active criminal cases in which uh, the defenders are journalists in all courts, courts in Croatia at the end of last year is, was uh, 110. This year, uh, as I said, uh, 26 media outlets responded to a survey of Croatian uh, Journalists Association. Um, related to the number of lawsuits, this media outlet usually have legal aid, but still. 65% of them responded that lawsuits make it harder for them to do business, while 26% find it difficult to handle lawsuits. The latter is relevant to small or non-profit media outlets, which are brought uh, to bring a collapse by such lawsuits. The number shows that we live in a culture of harassment and intimidation of journalists and media by using lawsuits, which are now a new model of attacks of journalism. Of particular concern is the fact that high-ranking state officials, local sheriffs, and even judges themselves are involved in filming lawsuits. Okay, and uh, uh, we are asking for, you probably know, and people on this panel, most of them are from Croatia. Uh, so we are asking for changes in the legislation in order to reduce the pressure of lawsuits. That change must be made in order to decriminalize all crimes against honor and reputation, which we have been proposing for years. We appeal to the government to do so urgently. We believe that civil law provides enough space for all those who consider themselves eligible for uh, claim and receive appropriate satisfaction. In the end, I will mention only some of the most recent cases. For example, uh, our my colleague and my friend, publisher and journalist of nonprofit portal Virovitica.net, Gordon Gazdek, uh, had to pay um, to Roman and Nikolic, uh, um, I think uh, 1,000 euro uh, because uh, uh, she suited him 
She's, uh, I, I have to explain to our guest, uh, Romana Nikolic uh, is public figure, political, a politician, member of parliament, uh, and she was convicted for threatening that. And because of that, uh, she was legally convinced. It. Uh, and uh, a lot of media published uh, this information. But in the meantime, she has been uh, rehabilitated. rehabilitated. Yeah, you understand me. Uh, and so she's considered that uh, she's unconvicted now and believes that journalists should not mention this note from her bi biography, uh, which is, from my point of view, complete absurd. Uh, but she suited uh, not just the Gazdek, uh, she suited uh, what, uh, most uh, media, and she won. And uh, Gazdek had to pay, uh, other media had to pay to Romana Nikolic. Uh, uh, so th that's one of really absurd case in Croatia. And of course, this is the case of another serial uh, 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 prosecutor uh, from Osijek, uh, this uh, judge Ante Verban, uh, who filled as many as uh, five lawsuits against just Telegram portal, demanding uh, damages of uh, 150,000 kunas for each uh, of these lawsuits. Uh, and uh, as Jelka said, uh, this judge, uh, uh, Jelko Verban, Tonko Verban, uh, is the winner on the competition for biggest bully in Europe uh, at the case coalition competition. So there is so many uh, examples as uh, these uh, two examples of uh, this judge and the member of parliament, uh, very known politician. Uh, but what I want to say on the end, uh, you know, a uh, few weeks ago, uh, because we had these um, workshops about safety of journalists, and I uh, invited the journalists to send me short video uh, about uh, threats and um, attacks and everything. And you know, most of them in this short video said that uh, they really can survive threats and attacks. But uh, you know, safety is such a big problem. But they they said they they. They, they are afraid that they can't survive uh, so many lawsuits and uh, threats uh, uh, by slap. So this is really, really big and serious problem in Croatia. And um, we see goodwill from institutions with these uh, workshops and uh, open dialogue, but we need concrete action, concrete changes. Okay, I hope that you hear me. I'm in some corridor here. Uh, thank you, Maya. I, I did hear you. I, uh, and I think that also participants uh, hear you really well. Uh, uh, because we also, we have a question. I will uh, just read it now. Uh, so participants are asking for the statistics uh, which, you, which you mentioned, where they can be found. So maybe you can share it in a, uh, in a Q&A uh, box. Uh, already, but okay. also I will send. I will send the link on English. Uh, uh, what is published right now? Okay, but we can also, uh, and I invite uh, all all the panelists. If you want to share some really useful materials uh, about slabs later on, we can also send it later together with the recording uh, of the conference. I think it would be more than uh, welcome, not only by participants, but uh also by people who will later on um uh, see the recording and maybe have maybe want to to read uh, more about it um i don't see uh, any other questions so i would i mean uh, uh, all three of you mentioned so so many things and i personally want to ask you so many uh, questions but uh, uh, just uh, just to start uh, with uh, with something, um, Maya uh, that was the last to say. Like uh, we have this judge in Croatia who will uh, who who won uh, on the slap contest, and I saw uh, and I believe that Nora mentioned that in recommendation of some measures, anti-slap measures, it is also mentioned that um, uh, judges uh, should be also educated about it. So 
how do you see that uh, they all even even though maybe the country the member states will be supportive at the end uh, about the directive how do you think this will work out at the end if we have uh, in one hand judges who are using slap and the other and in the other hand there will be maybe the same judges who will face slap cases and then we'll have to decide yeah this is slap case and yeah to to follow some uh speed procedure to even to to see it as a as a slap and maybe just one additional question to charlie as as you worked in uh, us previously uh i know that there is many anti-slap uh legislation and measures uh starting in in uh, us so do you see this also happening and in what time uh in europe so maybe Nora, first about opinion about this uh, education of judges, and maybe then Charlie uh, about uh, anti-slap measures in other countries. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I, I, I'm not fully sure how to understand your question. Um, of course, it's a it's an issue if we say we need to train lawyers and judges. So. Um, that they first of all know about the phenomenon of slaps, that they uh, can like support the process of early dismissal. Um, at the same time, of course, we have a problem, as I said, if we have a um, non-independent or captured judiciary in a country, right? Then um, uh, you have the yeah challenge to to um, have judges who are um, at least not supportive in 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 this process. Um, and um, if you ask me how what what idea I have um, how to solve that, I mean, uh, <laughs> that's I guess a, um, a broader problem um, on a political uh, uh, level. Um, but again, then I think we have uh, um, maybe other measures or. Um, other possibilities on on national implement implementation on how to circumvent that and um here again though we kind of come into the problem of who um, are the plaintiffs uh how much political will do we have uh if the plaintiffs for example are politicians themselves in some of the countries um so that's definitely definitely a challenge um but maybe charlie you want you want to add to that yeah, I'll, I'll just add very briefly to that. The because one thing I I left out when I was talking about the the proposed directive is that the directive was part of a package of measures which also included a recommendation. The recommendation is non-binding, as as is suggested by the word recommendation, but it's something which has been carefully monitored by the European Commission. The the uh, uh, and its enforcement is it's already in effect, and so its enforcement is already being monitored. It, that recommendation includes pro a provision about training the judiciary. Um, and it also includes other provisions about the regulation of lawyers, legal, legal profession more generally. Um, so that is something which is already afoot. In terms of how that's going to be done, I mentioned in my short presentation about there being an expert group of the European Commission that was set up. And that is how they're doing it. So the European Commission is establishing national contact points and that that's going to sit alongside this existing expert group, which consists of civil society representatives, lawyers, academics, and so on. And they are going to be trying to facilitate training and setting this up. So, you know, hopefully this will actually lead to sort of a greater familiarity and awareness of the problem. And hopefully that will change some behavior. But as Nora says, yeah, this is obviously a problem. And, you know, when it comes to regulation, that's obviously something that needs to be advanced in parallel with these measures. Okay, can, can I say something? Of okay. course, yeah, yeah. Go on. Well, first of all, probably our guests may know, uh, um, may not know, but uh, uh, our judicial system is uh, burned it with many problems. We are suffering uh, the uh, consequences of numerous bad policies in our recent history. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can't even be influenced, uh, not even, but uh, they can be influenced by political will, even if there is political will in Croatia. 
um, I want to say that uh, some steps have been taken in our country, uh, but even earlier than in other countries. Uh, and some of them is, um, you know, like by recommendation. Instead, we know that recommendations are just recommendations. Uh, but, you know, question is, uh, do we have a time or our colleagues and uh, people who work in media to wait for uh, uh, results to be felt, you know that's uh, our fear because we are we are we are already so you know exhausted of uh, uh, like more than five years this uh, 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 slap uh, uh, pressure, and um, from my personal point of view, for me it seems that you know something is changed also in uh, uh, this uh, process uh, and this system. For example, I was in this, uh, I was uh, a witness on um, uh, Zovko's case, again, hard uh, against Zovko, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, uh, hard uh, yes, uh, against Zovko. And um, I witnessed it in the morning and judge like, half hour after that said oh my god not again uh what are you talking about i will give a verdict like at two o'clock uh and uh, uh zovko won again you know, you know it was the seventh time that zovko won uh, uh, uh in the process against him uh uh so um it seems like something slightly changed um as uh, I hope that the judges also became aware what some some of them what is slap, but um, it has to be stronger and faster because every day I receive I, I saw uh, on Twitter today that my colleague uh, from Telegram uh, received another another lawsuit uh, from uh, Pero Pripu, Peter Pripu, Peter Pero, I don't know the name of this guy, but uh, uh, this guy is a really powerful uh, owner of uh, a company for garbage, you know those guys, and uh, he suited uh, uh, Anna Rajk Nezhevich again. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Maya, completely, that we do... There is some changes slowly uh, going on, but uh, I ask you about uh, like what is the future. I also want to ask you about the future of the directive because um, I was involved in uh, when there was a access to justice uh, directive uh, out in for environmental cases, and then it was just be because of the pressure for from. Uh, a number of uh, member states, it just uh, went in a drawer. So it didn't, it, it wasn't issued at the end. Do you, uh, Charlie and Nora, think that this can also happen with the uh, anti slap directive or it is really serious and it's going well and it will be uh, at the end adopted and then, uh, yeah, had to be uh, accepted by, by the member states? Uh, this is a difficult question, and uh, I'm obviously going to be wary about making any firm predictions about how this is going to develop. I think the main where where we've heard skepticism. Let me re rephrase this: in some some countries will say that they just don't have a problem with slaps. Uh, they'll say that there are no slaps in that country. They'll just deny the existence of it, and so then they will question the competence of the of the European Union to legislate on this. Um, and they'll say it's a matter of domestic law anyway. But I think I don't I think there are there are there are, I don't know of any member states who have actually said, look, there is no such thing as a cross-border slabs. And I think in in its most narrowly understood sense of a of 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 a slap involving parties domiciled in two different countries, or 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 a, a slap involving someone or a, a company domiciled in a non-European Union country, I think that is something which it would be easier to legislate on. So I think the question, one of the main kind of questions will come down to scope, both in terms of the personal jurisdiction, so that is, who does this apply to, 
and over the question of what cross-border means. I think that might be where it comes down to. So I would hate to make any sort of prediction, but I do think a, a key question is going to be about how widely this will this will stretch and whether or not this is going to scratch the surface of the problem or whether or not it's really going to meaningfully deal with the problem across Europe. And that's what we really need to be pushing on. Thank you. Nora, maybe you also have an opinion about it. <laughs> I want to be cautious like like Charlie. I mean, just to say my person, I want to be optimistic, like really, really. Mm. But as I was uh, uh, really much involved in the, uh, in a creating a proposal of access to justice uh, directive, and we, and we were so happy. It went really well at a certain period of time, and then you know nothing. So yeah. it's 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 really hard to stay optimistic when you know about something like that. No, and I, I mean I understand that skepticism, especially um, in countries where, uh, yeah, you you cannot be sure of again the political will, the independence of the judiciary, and I guess that um, of course we have that risk of of you know a directive then either not being fully implemented or implemented in a way to circumvent the the the, the actual problems, um, or. Uh, um, yeah, implemented kind of in a shady way so um, that you cannot really expect change on, on a national level. Uh, so I think what here again is actually crucial um, that uh, Charlie was speaking about working groups. Uh, we do not only now push for the adoption of um, the directive um, on uh, the European Council level, but also that national working groups uh, and the case coalition is active in monitoring the actual implementation on national level. And I think that was also something uh, crucial, for example, on the whistleblower directive. And um, let's say, so the, the task is not over uh, when the directive is, is adopted, but really then uh, the actual implementation, the um, monitoring of um, uh, the implementation without circumventing the um, or without like filling the loopholes, let's say um, that that will be crucial. Thank you, uh, Maya. You I also just, want to... just a few sentences. I want to say that uh, look, I think that huge things have been done, and uh, these people from Create Co Coalition is really great they really changed things uh you know few years ago we was just like a journalist who uh, uh publicly speaking about uh, something no one knows anything but they really opened the door for us in a parliament in european commission um we have results we have concrete documents now we have to push further. We have to, you know, you know, scream, uh, 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 continue to, 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 to explain how difficult it is for journalists to work and activists also, because also in Croatia, you know that all, uh, except Tesla, we have those uh, uh, people in uh, Pula, and uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a similar situation, uh, but. I'm, I am optimistic because I think those two years, few years, and uh, these people in case coalition and other organizations, uh, and my organization also, show that we can change the thing. We can make some progress and uh, some concrete results, but we have to continue this fight. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think that how uh, I think that Charlie said that this uh, anti-coalition movement is uh, growing and uh, is getting stronger. And I can see that. I mean, uh, like I mentioned that in the introduction part for us, it was really crucial, really, you know, in 2009 to have a support from uh, other lawyers from other countries saying you should use this and this and and also some uh to to talk about that in the media it was it was a lot you know to 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 have also citizens on your side saying like oh, this is outrageous that one uh ngo is being sued by the ministry you know for for saying out loud their 
opinion about something. So uh, I think it's it's really great that we are uh, getting stronger and maybe more connected also. So we are learning from from each other how to fight slap cases. But I think that also the other side is maybe also learning uh, from each other because yeah, I can see this this is really becoming some kind of a trend, you know, to, to sue uh, journalists, to sue uh, activists and to have this um, like really small and uh, and a lot of cases against one activist. Uh, uh, Maya probably remembers what happened in Warsawska uh, protest. I mean, it was 152 people were arrested at the same day and then there were several cases against those people you know launched uh, in separate ways so it was really to show the strength and to show them you know it doesn't pay off to be activists uh because yeah. this will happen i mean it ended really well at the end but it really showed what uh, government uh, what was government's opinion about you know activists trying to fight and to preserve their uh, pedestrian zone. So, yeah. yeah. You know, including my husband. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it was really funny. I mean, if if uh, participants will not mind, but uh, actually I think that we met then because Maya called me and said, my husband is arrested. <laughs> can, can you help him? <laughs> and, you know, just to explain now on the end of our panel, you know, it was like situation. I'm a journalist. And that's primary my job. And that day I have to, I, I was anchor of this uh, afternoon show. And I said to my husband, oh my God, someone has to be there. They block <laughs> street. If I sit on the street, they will arrest me. But I have to be in the studio at the five o'clock. And then he just said, but you know, uh, my husband is uh, some serious guy. And he said, okay, I'm going. But what I want to say, it's much important. Yes, this was, that was a really strong action of a citizen, not just activists, but citizens. But uh, I want to say that uh, we have to m mention a big help, uh, crucial help of our great lawyers. Vanya Juric and Vesna Laburic. Vanya Juric is also in a, a European group of uh, expert group for slabs. Uh, real, you know, they really helped us in all those processes. And we can, and I think that most of journalists can, can count on them in every minute. And uh, with this uh, slab issues, they were really, really big help for us. Yeah, th thank you, Maya, for that. I mean, uh, Vanya was, of course, invited, and she was really, really sorry, but she couldn't make it because she is uh, at the courts uh, the whole day, it's maybe maybe fighting uh, <laughs> against uh, uh, slaps. You, you never know. Uh, we have uh, five minutes left, so if each of you want to to say some. Uh, Final uh, supporting words. I would I would push you for that for in a minute. Uh, it yeah. It you please do it. I can kick things off if that had helped. Um, just because I think it, it leads on to the last question you asked about the prospects of the directive, and uh, you know I gave a very there a very specific answer, but I think it's important just to emphasize that. And again, this is building on what Maya said, which is that this is what we built with the coalition against SAPS in Europe. It's a huge coalition and it's a very diverse coalition. It encompasses representatives of a range of different public watchdogs, activists, journalists, advocacy groups, whistleblowers and so on. So it's I, I don't think we should understate or underestimate its its strength and its potential power in getting in, in advancing these anti slap solutions. Uh, as we've said, as I said before, and as, as Nora said as well, so much of it will come down to a to a low, to a, on a national level. We've we've proven to I think I think we can say very influential on the EU level. The fact that we've got this far is itself testament to that. And I think we can push this. It will be difficult. There are going to be challenges, and there are a lot of skeptical, if not outright hostile, member states in this. 
But I think there's a huge amount we can achieve together. And I think if there is anyone, you know, watching this who would like to get involved, please do get in touch because there is always room for, for more assistance, especially when it comes to some of these countries like Croatia, which has a, as Maya said, real problem with SNAPs. Thank you. Nora or Maya, who will go first? It's it's completely fine if, if uh, would, you've would, already said everything. I would say just one word as uh, 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 Charlie said, join work, working together in solidarity. Uh, they, we uh, have shown that uh, we can if we are really together. And I think that we just have to continue and uh, fight together. I can I can really just back that and I just um, posted the the link of uh, the case website again in the chat maybe you can share that with all the participants um, because I think yeah uh, collaboration here is really key I mean we came so far now and also you know starting with raising awareness on this and this is also something uh, we see outside the EU that this needs to continue um, as I said in my intro uh, many people are not yet even aware of the phenomenon of slaps so we need to kind of you know lift the gray shadow also on so many more slap lawsuits um, raise awareness on this among civil society organizations and of course on the international uh, uh, sphere and then um, on the EU but also on the Council of your um, recommendation really uh, um, work on on national level uh, with civil society and uh, local authorities. So that will be crucial in the years to come. But yes, I agree. We have come very far, and now um, uh, the collaboration is really crucial. And we are not stopping. Uh, just just to finish with the with the comment uh, in uh, Q and A box, uh, Lydia Penko says, "Good work and support for never ending fight for better world." Oh, oh my God. Uh, we are all in this and we all help uh, with our part in this fighting. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. And I would just finish with thanking all the, the panelists for being here. I know it's really hard to find uh, time and I'm, I'm personally really sorry that it was not in person conference because then we would have uh, uh, more time and, uh, and to talk during the breaks and have some coffee, which we deserved. I hope you had it uh, during the break or you will have it uh, now. And just to finish with the, with the note that um, I'm uh, when I'm speaking uh, to to students or to activists uh, about our lawsuits, I'm always saying that there is nothing romantic in in being sued and being sued for uh, uh, many many years. And but knowing that you are doing the right thing, it's it's really comforting. And then. Uh, it's a big comfort uh, to have support from uh, different coalitions and from different uh, NGOs and, and journalists writing about it. So, yeah, we can we can just be be stronger in that. Uh, thank you all. And uh, just to, to let you know to the participants that uh, we will see each other again uh, tomorrow uh, at 10 at the, uh, and to continue with the conference at the same link. So you can use. Uh, the same link for that.